Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is regularly scheduled meeting of the Select Board of the Town of Sunderland. Let's call it the order at 6.30. Uh, first order of business is approve the minutes of September 6th. I motion we approve the minutes of sep September 6th. Seconded. A motion made and seconded to approve the minutes. Is there any comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Jeffrey, 3-0. Thank you. New business. Fire department update. Chief, what you got to tell us? Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me over. Um, I don't have an awful lot of uh, earth-shattering news, but the one thing that I want to get a head start on, you might say, is fire prevention week. It's in October, the 9th through the 15th. Uh, at the tail end of that, the fire department's going, going to have an open house uh, from um, 10 to 2 on that day. And we're going to have an awful lot to do, um, some static displays, some active displays, uh, a safe trailer that is, uh, it's almost like an RV, a uh, tow behind RV, but it's configured so kids can experience what it's like to be in a, a house full of smoke. There's a, a, a tasteless, odorless, um, mist that we inject in and it gives the kids a chance to experience that in a safe environment and that dovetails nicely with what the theme is for this year's fire prevention week which is plan your escape fire won't wait and um, interestingly enough this year is the 100th anniversary of fire prevention week as it's been celebrated in some respects, but also recognized. And the, I want to make sure I get the date right. It came out of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. After that, there was um, just enough media and word spread about that tragedy and took it a good you know, 50 years, but in um, 1922, the NFPA began this initiative just to draw attention to fire safety. And the, the, the real thesis this year again is planning your escape. It's about having a plan with your family and whether you've got little kids, grown kids, elderly parents, or it's just two people living in a house or one person in a house, it's good to think about where you might go if you had a fire, not, not only getting out safely, but also where you meet up. And do you have a spot in the neighbor's yard across the street, what have you, where everybody can uh, get together afterwards? And on one hand, it's good to have those plans in place, especially for little kids. They seem to be a little bit more at ease, knowing that there is something that they know how to do and that they can control and uh, they can be ready. And also from the perspective of the firefighters, uh, when we arrive on a scene for a house fire, whether it's very dramatic or not, it's always very hectic. And the first thing that we always think about is, where are the people? Is everybody out? Is everybody okay? Is anybody missing? So if everybody can be in one spot, and we can identify immediately uh, what the answer to that question is, that's what we appreciate very much. And I'll also put a, uh, a plug in there's been a lot of conversation in years past about fire sprinklers in residential homes. And um, there's a, a group in the state that's attempting to get it made part of the building code. And they're, every year they're gaining more traction. Eventually, I would say, we'll probably get there. Uh, but the difference in a home fire that has sprinklers in it versus non-sprinklers, uh, it's a very dramatic difference. Where the, uh, the sprinklers don't operate like you might see in the movies where there's thousands of gallons of water coming through. All the sprinklers don't go off as soon as the smoke detector goes off. Um, the sprinkler heads only go off where they're exposed to heat. And they don't use an awful lot of water, relatively speaking, 30 gallons a minute, sort of like a big shower head. And costs are certainly going up with everything, but if you look, to put a sprinkler system in an average sized home might be $15,000, give or take. So that compared to the loss of that investment um, is something to think about. And
from from our standpoint on the fire department, we've spoken to some folks who have um, thought about putting sprinklers into their homes, and we're supportive. There's a code that stipulates exactly what is required for it to meet the National Fire Protection Association's um, criteria. But if there's a fire protection engineer that's involved, in maybe half of the building would be sprinklered now and the other half would be sprinklered when it's renovated or something like that. We're more than willing to listen and so is the building inspector. So um, a lot of questions people would have, but I wanted to throw that out this evening in case people are uh, thinking that the gears are working on maybe some work in their home. And the, um, the other thing that I'll mention here, we've had a spate of uh, kitchen fires and near miss kitchen fires in town, in private residences and in, in, in the apartments. And the one thing that I'd like to uh, reiterate is for folks to be mindful when they're cooking. Most of them, there's four that really stand out in the last eight months. Uh, one of them was a freak accident. The other three were due to inattention while folks were cooking. And one, two were very, very close to being pretty serious incidents. And on the, on the flip side, as far as outdoors are, is concerned, we are getting some rain finally, and uh, that's helping a little bit. The aquifer is still very dry. I have not heard if they've changed their stance, but the uh, DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation in the state, uh, during the summer, they uh, quelled all open cooking fires on campsites in the state parks. I don't believe they've flipped that switch back on as of yet, but just gives a little bit of credence to how dry it is. Even though we're getting some rain, two or three sunny days um, after the rain stops, and it'll be quite dry again. So we're going to be on our toes until November, and things start getting really cold and damp. So, Stephen, you had a thing the other night on uh, Bull Hill. Yes. So I thought you sent out a notice was pretty good. You want you want to review that? Sure. It went. It worked out really well. We were at another location in town earlier in the evening for um, a call for um, somebody that burned their dinner and set up the smoke detectors in the uh, in the building that they lived in. We came back from that, and just as we were leaving the station, we got the tone for a mountain biker that was injured on Bull Hill, and it was after dark. They were on the Robert Frost Trail, so they were reported. So we had personnel at the station who dispatched in our the Humvee in the um, brush truck with the utility vehicle, uh, the little side-by-side -side utility vehicle in the ATV. We went up, uh, South County Ambulance met us there. They had a really good response. And we met at the trailhead on Bull Hill Road for the Robert Frost Trail. And fortunately, Within a minute of us getting there, and as we were starting to assemble all of our equipment, uh, one of the people that was riding with the party that was hurt met us and was able to show us where they were. They weren't exactly on the Robert Frost Trail, uh, so it's a good thing that they came down. Otherwise, we could have been Marco Poloing for, for them for quite a while because uh, there's a pretty extensive network of trails on that part of the mountain. They're close together and uh, takes in different areas. But we made contact with the injured party pretty quickly and was able to stabilize them and got them down off of the mountain. With the, the initial response and the initial report that we had been given through dispatch, we suspected that a helicopter might be necessary just due to the degree of injury. And they did end up, uh, Lifestar from uh, Springfield, actually they're at Barnes, but uh, Bay State's helicopter accepted the mission. They came, we had a, two fire trucks that were staffed at Cliffside Apartments in that open area uh, between Cliffside and Route 116. So we were able to establish a landing zone there. The helicopter landed and we had, um, we were going very slow getting the party off the mountain because it was very rough. And they were about three quarters of a mile to a mile in. And in that time, uh, Waitley police officer on duty shuttled the flight crew from the helicopter to us on Bull Hill, and they were able to evaluate the patient just as soon as we got him down to the uh, uh, down to the road, and that was great because there was really no lag in care. 
and they established that the person was going to go, so they loaded them into the ambulance, went down, uh, transferred them uh, lock, stock, and barrel to Lifestar, and Lifestar took off a few minutes after that. And uh, it was successful. We won't know how the party ends up, but we were all optimistic when the, uh, when the helicopter left that he was in good care and uh, was going to have a great chance at recovery. Well, I, it, it's interesting because not more than what, two, three weeks ago, we had a conversation about transfer station mm -hmm. and about the helicopter landing. And so the question was, well, when's the last time a helicopter landed in town? <laughs> that was so, my first thought when I read the, the newspaper article also. <laughs> so the bottom line is we aren't going to talk about helicopters landing anymore. Well, and we've had the, the, the challenge that we have in town is a lot of the landing zones that we had, we can't use anymore. Uh, there's a solar field on two of them now. Uh, one of them in North Sunderland, it depends on if the hay is cut or not. And Bull Hill, initially I was thinking, well, we can land a helicopter right on Bull Hill. However, the helicopter pilots do not like to land on agricultural land that's been harvested. Uh, corn stubble, all the chaff, it is not good. They would have taken one look at it with their light and chosen another spot. So we've got to be pretty careful with our, our locations too. Um, flat, flat, short grass is what they prefer. They'll make some exceptions, but that's really what they look for. There's an awful lot at stake when they land and they don't know the area and they're relying on us to tell them that it's safe. Um, they want to have it as, want it to look as good as possible. No, I, I was just, I just thought it was. Yeah, pretty ironic. Yeah, it, it is, but, and, and I guess that's why we plan, and that's why, we, and, and that's, and sometimes, it, it, sometimes you, a, a ride in a truck on Sunday is not a ride on a truck on Sunday, because you're, you're, you're looking for things, and, 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 and things become, you, you, you get a better idea. Let's put it that way. Well, without a doubt. And to that point, too, we've got a, um, a newer group of firefighters now that have joined the department. And we've still got uh, a great team of veterans, if you will. We still have um, eight academy, mass fire academy trained firefighters, but we've hired a couple new ones. And it's important for them to get used to the equipment. Uh, even if they have a CDL driver's license, one of them does. Uh, every truck is different, and being able to have them experience driving the truck on a Sunday afternoon where it's bright and sunny and there may not be a lot of traffic and they don't have to go anywhere uh, with any pressure on their shoulders is the way to do it uh, versus having people thrown in and uh, potentially under more stress than they should be under. Absolutely. In, in those situations. And, um, Agreed. The, Agreed. The, the only other thing that I'll mention to that end is we've got a, aside from the, the state training that's available, there's a shorter term training that we get all of our people involved with initially because uh, there's really very little wait time and not much of a, um, a ceiling on attendance. But the, um, there's a group of fire departments in northwestern Franklin County that have started a training program. Two of our firefighters, uh, two of our op fire officers actually, are instructing in that uh, program. So there's been a little bit of a resurgence in education and training. Uh, when I started 26 years ago, there was a little bit, there was a little bit of a lull, and now it's really coming back pretty strong in the last three, four years. That's good to see. Good. Good. Well, train again, trainings are so important. I mean, you know, e even if, I mean, even if you're on the river you're, you're, or you're, you, you take the four wheel, you know, the UTV up, and it's like, and you're talking about trails. I mean, when I was dog sledding up there, I could go up there all day long and never cross the same trail twice. And I, matter of fact, I ran into a guy on a snowstorm, and we were, 
and I, every once in a while, I, follow, I would see his footprints with a, his big one, a little kid, in the snow. And he was going, he, he was going towards Bull Hill. And I finally ran into him. He said, how much farther it is to the tower? I said, well, it depends on how you go. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, it's about five hours <laughs> walking that way. Uh, or you go out here and you get on Plum Tree. But he had no idea where he was. So... We give them, it, you can go a long ways. You can, and compared to some other areas, it's not as bad. Unless you're walking in circles, you're going to get to a main road probably in a day, no matter where you're going. Yeah. But you're right. It's uh, there have been an awful lot of people on the mountain for the first time with recreation. Uh, the DCR had to make more parking on Reservation Road to accommodate it uh, because at one point last summer. We had an ambulance call at Cranberry Pond, but we couldn't get, could barely fit an ambulance down on Reservation Road because people had parked on both sides and it was so narrow. So it's uh, it's a good thing. It's great that that resource is being used, but uh, my plan that we've got to keep in mind. Absolutely. Thank you, Stevie. Any other questions? Crystal, Nathan? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Just my kids loved the the trailer the last time you guys had it out. Excellent. Um, it was quite fun. So. Excellent. Bring them back. I will. Probably have smoky bear <laughs> Awesome. And and you said that was going to be on the last day of the the week, the fifteenth. Yes, it's going to be 15th. on the fifteenth. Great. Ten to two, and there should be some pretty good um, notices coming out to the school and library and Facebook and so forth on that. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. It seems like you bought the truck at the right time. Yes. I heard the prices are escalating it's, uh, exponentially right now. It was it was unpleasant to see how the bids came in when we did buy, and now it would be downright frightening. So, like I say, timing's everything. Got, got several years to even have to think about that again. So. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, next up, one day liquor alcohol licenses for Mike's Maze on September 30th, October 7th, October 14th, October 21st, and October 28th. David, you want to talk? Yeah. Tell us what uh, you want to do. What was that? Tell us what you want to do, David. We are looking to put on our, what's now become our annual beer mazes at Mike's Maze. Um, essentially, we have a separate corn field besides our normal corn maze, um, and we invite uh, on each different event. We have six breweries that come out to the field. Um, they set up out in the corn field, and then um, guests have a chance to come in and track down um, their samples of beer at the six breweries out in the corn field. Um, and so we do this each Friday night, um, starting September 30th through the end of October. Um, each night the event starts at six, it runs till about nine. Um, nine's when we start chasing people out. <laughs> and um, it's a really good time. We've done it, we realized, we're thinking back, the first time we did it was 2017, I think. Um, and it's been wildly successful. Um, tend to sell out uh, each night um, if we get them up and posted in time. So um, we're looking to continue the tradition and do it again this year. Jeffrey, what can you fill us in? Anything? Um, yeah, we, so we have the applications for the first two, which are the third uh, September 30th and October 7th. Um, totally filled out. Uh, we know the dates for the other ones. Um, we haven't completely gotten the uh, list of brewers and certificates of insurance. So if you wanted to approve all of them contingent on those things, um, you could do that or you could just approve uh, the first two or consider the first two and then um, consider the other three at a later date. I, I just looking at the you got pretty good lineups here, Dave. We do the first. Let's see the first. I pulled it up. Uh, first week we had Hitchcock. Um, let's see Iron Duke Brewing, uh, Pirate Valley Brewing, 
And then Scant River Building Eight and Altruist Building. Second week, Fort Hill, Exhibit A, Abandoned Building. Uh, Four Phantoms Brewing, Element, and then Scantic again, Scantic River again. Um, and that's just the first two weeks. Um, and yeah, we, I know we had at least progression online for another one, Field Crest Brewing. Um, and yeah, we're still reaching out to other breweries to fill up the last three weeks there. But yeah, the, the breweries, a lot of these people, they've come back every single year because um, they. They love the event, and you know, we ask them what weeks they're available, and we'll get people who will put down for two or three weeks because it's it's just a really good time out there. David, do you have any uh, people make reservations, or how do they get how do how can they attend? Um, tickets are for sale on our website um, right now, MikeSmith.com, um, and they are. We do limit the attendance for each one to about um, three hundred guests per event, so. Um, if people are interested, I always tell them to go on and buy them ahead of time. Buy them now and don't wait because they they do sell out. So, um, and yeah, we don't we don't there is no give in that number. <laughs> that is <laughs> okay. The final number. We get plenty of people who are like, yeah, I just need one ticket. I don't have it. I'm sorry. So. All right. Um, so, what's the pleasure of the board? Do you want to do you want to issue? For the entire slate contingent upon uh, successful uh, submission of uh, information. That's the way I'm leaving, yeah. That's, that seems like the way to do it. I mean, most of these, guys, these brewers you've dealt with before anyways, right? Yeah, we always, we've always dealt with them before. The trickiest thing that always holds us up getting everything in um, is getting the insurance, right. the DOIs from them. And... Uh, I mean, Pastor, we start this process back in early August, and it just takes that long to yeah. um, kind of pull it all together. But yeah, we always, I always make sure to get them on the weekend for the day. But yeah, we worked with, I think the only new people this year, I think Iron Duke and Fieldcrest we haven't worked with before, but everyone else we've worked with before, and they know the deal. So and those are already on your first two weeks that you have all the paperwork for. I already have all the paperwork. Right. So, yeah, I have no problem with. It's not a new event. You know, if this isn't like something with, with a lot of unknowns or anything like that. As long as they get the paperwork they need to in, I got no problem with the, approving it okay. ahead of time. Okay. So, uh, right now, the um, we're looking at a motion to approve contention upon successful submission of information for Mike's May's one day alcohol licenses for September 30, September 30th, October 7th, October 14th, October 21st, and October 28th. David, what happens if it rains? I was gonna say there's rain dates for the following, the day, the day after for each of those. I okay. I on the first two applications, or at least I forgot to, but Cindy Hall was reminding me about that. Moment. So it's on the first two. It's, it's, the rain dates are basically just the Saturday right after that Friday. Okay, so so I'll look for a motion. Um, with rain dates would be the immediate following. Okay, so I motion we approve five one day liquor licenses for Mike's Maze, starting on September thirtieth with the five consecutive Fridays, rain dates of Saturday. I second that motion. Contingent upon success, successful completion of paperwork. Okay. Motion. Motion and seconded. Motion made, seconded. Any discussion? Hearing no other discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Jeff, 3 0. Thank you, David. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you hope, to, hope to see you. Yeah. If I can get a ticket. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I know. Don't he wait. Gave you the website. Go to the website. Alrighty, um, Jeffrey, we got a point. Insurance advisory committee members. Yes. So we've been working hard to get the membership. We've talked. To, I think we talked about it two weeks ago. 
Um, we're still looking for a retiree to serve on the committee, um, but given that we have all the other seats uh, figured out and we want to get started so that we have an idea going into budgeting, what we're looking at, um, recommending that we appoint the, the members that we have now so they can begin to do the work. And um, once we have a retiree, we can appoint them and get uh, happy to get that person caught up to speed um, at that time. So recommended, um, do you want me to mm -hmm. name the people and who yep. they represent? Okay. Um, and I apologize to anyone whose name I mispronounce. Donna Carmody, uh, representing Union 38. Layla Cohen, representing non-union school employees. Uh, Officer Ben Peters, representing the Sunderland Police Officers Association Local 398. Uh, Catherine Umstadt for the library. Um, George Emery for the highway department. Uh, Heather Davis and Cindy Bennett representing other town employees. Um, I will note that there are um, two department heads um, on this list and we tried to avoid that, but the, the employees were not particularly interested in serving and we want, <coughs> excuse me, we wanted them represented by somebody. So um, that, that's why they're on there, but we did try to get uh, employees or non-department head employees. Okay, and, and, you want, and you want to just review who is eligible to be on the committee? Um, at this, uh, employees of the town, to the, each group or organization within the town has, is supposed to nominate or elect somebody to be there. So um, eligibility depends on what department you're in or, or um, organization or union. And then for the retiree, it's just a retiree of the town. Okay. So we have seven names that you've put forward here. Um, entertain a motion to appoint. So I motion we appoint, do you want me to list all the names? Yeah. Well, you don't, don't, yeah, you don't have to read them. You, okay. Uh, as, yeah. All right. I motion we um, appoint as presented in the document before us members for the insurance advisory committee seconded all right discussion uh, Jeff I think the most important thing is is get the group in a meeting as soon as possible and 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 try to move forward because it's a it's a you know something that we talked about and I think I think the more information everybody has, I think uh, the better decisions that we can come up with. So, okay. What happens if we never find a retiree? Can the can the committee finish its charter without a retiree on the on it, or is it gonna? Are we gonna find that be, be trouble? No, I think the that we did our due diligence. You know, the advice from council and what I've heard from other communities is. It's, this listing is aspirational and the fact that we are working really hard to get representation from everywhere I don't think we're gonna get in trouble obviously it would be ideal if we had a retiree um, but I I think that the, there's no if we don't find one eventually that it's not gonna be a big deal okay great now do we have any guidelines we're gonna give them as a town to you know that this is a projected dollar amount that the town can afford that this is something I mean and again I'm sure all these people totally understand that there's limitations of what a town can afford but without them having I, I just without them having something to work within understand you know we can certainly give them you know historical data on what we've paid recently um, or what we've budgeted for recently and what we've been billed for um, you know and then we can say here's a 
you know, typical increase or we're allowed to increase revenues by two and a half percent. So, you know, we're in my head, I'm planning a two and a half percent increase for um, the next fiscal year. But it, I think it's important to note that it's an advisory committee and ultimately it's the select board's decision yeah. to say, hey, that's a little too expensive. Maybe we can't do, you know, the $15 co-pays, but if we did it $20 and everything else stays the same, we can afford it. And that can be a discussion with the, with the advisory committee or something the select board does on their own. But if there is specific advice or guidance that, that you want to them to have, I'm happy to pass that along. I just well, would hate to see this group get together and come up with something that they're very interested in and find out that there's it's outside the means of i mean um, i i plan on attending the meetings okay um we also have the treasurer collector on the committee um, okay so i i think that that there there is a budgeting perspective and we could certainly as, as we get closer and have more numbers we could have a uh conversation with the finance committee as well to say this is what we're looking at this is what the cost would look at and and get their feedback before okay. final recommendation I, I would think it'd be appropriate if if at the initial meeting when you have everyone there you let you let the the group understand one of my thus at least membership of the board what they look for in a in a plan and and it's affordability for everyone not just a certain few meaning some people you you if you want to increase the percentage that's fine but are you we and and we could technically we could increase to 75 let's say 75 percent you go to 75 percent but now you have a 30 dollar copay or now, some people may not have a problem with that. Right. Or a $5,000 deductible or something that, right, some people won't have a problem with it, but right. it's a huge so, so for it, others. Yeah. You, you want to try to make sure that it's affordable for those that, that may be earning less on the pay scale. Uh, just in terms of the, the order of these things, they make their recommendation we eventually Discuss. vote on it. Do, is there any kind of buy-in from the town employees at large at that point? Do they get to vote on whether to adopt it or not? Or is that something that by appointing these people, they're kind of giving them the power to negotiate on their behalf? That, that they are supposed to represent the groups that, okay. that have uh, put their names forward. Okay. I, mean, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable for us to at that first meeting, be like, here's what the current cost is. We're looking at maybe maxing out at 2.5%, 3%, whatever it is we decide, we decide on. Um, and given that recommendation, of course, they can come back with a 5% increase, and we'll look at it. Maybe we won't be able to do it, but we'll look at it. Um, but I, I think, you know, Crystal's right. It, it doesn't make sense for them to sort of be thinking they can go 10% higher or 15% higher without knowing that that's going to end up being unreasonable then. Yeah, you got you got to let them know, and 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 explain and and I think we we have to. It it wouldn't be it wouldn't be outrageous to bring in some numbers that we had from from last year and shows what what changes if or if you want to add a, a, a you know increase a copay where you can increase your you know your percentage of contribution or you can because we we went through those numbers we we have all those numbers yep. and i and i think that that's an interest you know we should look at it but you should also you know maybe maybe there they come up there's there's someone who has a creative way of doing it and maybe maybe there's another policy that we hadn't hadn't been you know made aware of maybe and and see it's you know I know some towns will have different programs you know different op offer different programs and different percentages I don't know if I'd like to do that but you know what you'd have to let the insurance advisory group meet because maybe they see something that we aren't 
Yeah, and one of the things that I'd like to do sooner rather than later is bring in our uh, current yes. Maya rep to talk about some of the different options and how changing one thing would affect another thing and, and sort of also helping to set the table for the committee. And you may want to bring in a couple different reps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good points well, all around. I mean, again, it, if if you you have to go in with an understanding what cost, that has to be on the table. Absolutely. Yeah, I just like I said, it, it's going to be a lot of work for these people. These people have a that's a that's a big committee. There's a lot of work involved with that, and I would just yeah. Okay, so we have a motion. Yep. And seconded. Yep. yep. So we have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor of appointing the committee as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Jeff, three zero. Let's see if we can get to schedule that meeting. Next up, uh, review mosquito control booklet. Yes. So I, I will pass this around because this is the physical book, and then I'll try and pull it up. Now, who developed this booklet? Um, on the back, I think it says it was developed by the town of Sunderland with the help of the state. And so I looked at a, I didn't reinvent the wheel, but I looked at a, what other communities have done. Mm -hmm. um, the Center for Disease Control Prevention Mosquitoes webpage, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's Mosquito Borne Disease webpage, and the National Pesticide Information yeah. Center's Mosquito. Yeah, no, webpage. I'm seeing it right here. I was just wondering if. If it was just a collaboration of all these pulling material from other places, but yeah, and that that was kind of what it yeah. was. I saw how other, and this is probably not helpful because the way this <laughs> works out. Well, no, it's it's one in four. No, but I know, but it's nice because it says it right on that yeah. first page that I see. So, um, so. The reason this is coming up is when we opted out or applied to opt out of aerial spring by the state, we said we were going to put information about how to prevent mosquito bites on the website. Um, so I, you know, I think we probably could have just taken infographics and put them on there, but I thought having something that was a little bit more personalized um, that gave information uh, would be helpful. So, you know. It did not take a significant amount of time to put that all together. Um, but yeah, we're, the point would be to try and put that on the website. You know, this is kind of a not bad mosquito year because it was so dry. Um, what I've been hearing is that Tripoli and um, West Nile have uh, starting to see a couple cases, but a lot fewer in the Northeast than uh, in past years. So, um, but this is something we can reuse year after year um, yeah. and not just update. So as far as making this available to people in town, and again, obviously this year, we're almost out of mosquito season. So would this be something you would consider like maybe in closing with the tax bill or something like that so that it reached every, or the majority of the town people? Yeah. Uh, I don't know I don't, how much that would increase postage. Right. So that, that was that's the next question. If it would increase postage and the cost of putting this together is, is too much. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought about that, but things that I had thought about were obviously printing and having them available here at the library, maybe mm -hmm. at the post office. Um, and also at town meeting, which is in the spring and That's right true. at the beginning yeah. of, of mosquito season, um, having that at, at the front table just to remind mm -hmm. people. Um, but I'll, I will certainly... Um, I mean, I know it changes the size of the envelope and everything else, so it might not be, you know, a feasible thing to do. I'm just thinking of... A, that was just the first thought that came into my head about how to get it to as many people in town as possible. Yeah, and one of the things that we may want to consider, and I haven't thought about this, so I 
probably shouldn't suggest it, but you know, maybe just an annual mailing to residents with stuff like, how do I sign up for code red? What kind of information can I get? What, what do I, how do I contact people in town hall? You know, um, because we do have, uh, people that a, a, a large rental population, um, some of which turn over year after year. So, you know, getting them that information. So if there's an emergency, they're on the <laughs> list and things like that might not be a bad idea just to have an annual, you know, and, and maybe there are some residents that can say, Hey, we don't need that. <laughs> We've got mm -hmm. it for three years and we haven't moved. Yeah. Um, Is it worth seeing if we can stick a stack of these in the rental offices for the our department complexes? And maybe see like, hey, when people, new people come into town, you know, you give them their packet of all their information. Maybe slide one of these in there, because uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Yep. Great thought. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I just part of the reason was to see if you had any suggestions for improving it or other things you think the booklet should include, other information. Um, Why swatter? Just origami folding instructions on the back of how to turn it into a yeah, fly swatter. You know? Know. <laughs> the town of Sun on fly swatter. Mosquito swatter, sorry. Okay. That's good. It looks um, good. Thank you for putting that together. Okay, Jeff, how about uh, ARPA? ARPA, so we have, um, I guess before I get into this, I just heard last week that DLS is expecting to release the last, or the second tranche that was supposed to go to counties, county governments, um, so we should be seeing the remainder of the funds dispersed, I believe, by the end of the month. Um, and so there was one additional request, which is um, it was recommended that we hire a consultant to help our finance team close out uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, as you may recall, last year, I think we closed it out and filed for free cash in um, February, which is pretty late. March? March? Okay. Uh, the year before was January. So this would bring us back to a fall, you know, with, with this help, we would be able to close the books and um, file for free cash in October, get us back on track as far as having everything reconciled and um, we'd be able to move forward. So uh, it would be not to exceed $2,000 uh, for this project. So do you anticipate this being a just one year, we need it this year, and we will not need this financial consultant every year going forward type thing? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we, right now, yeah, we have the consultants and then we have that um, state uh, financial management review and so my hope is we get the consultant in we get everything good settled in October we have a couple months until they're planning to come like late winter early spring um, and that that's gonna be a good evaluation of hey have we managed to maintain this how are we looking how's everybody feeling and if um, if things aren't good and it's looking like we're going to need another consultant, then obviously we'd have a conversation about uh, what, what changes need to happen. And I, I actually think that the $2,000 is short money considering what, how difficult it is to try to put a budget together if you don't know how much free cash and stabilization you have available to you. It 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 makes everything everything is. It, it's it's so difficult. Um, I don't quite understand how we ever started getting to January, February, March before getting everything done, because it should be all done by November. And 
and, and it has been up until the last few years. So if this is the last, I, and I know we had problems with accounting services. Um, I understand that. Looks like they they they've stepped this year. They've stepped up to the plate. To if if we are actually on track to be done at sometime in October, then that means everybody is finally getting their act together. So that's good. So okay. So you're looking for a motion for two thousand dollars? Please. A motion. We. Appropriate two thousand dollars out of ARPA money for financial consulting services. Seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero. Thank you. All right. Um, select board updates. I got nothing. No meetings this past week. Okay. I don't think either. Um. So Jeff, I guess uh, senior centers moving in today. Senior to centers Sunderland. moving in today. Yes. Is your computer not working now? Yeah, my computer's not working. Yeah, that's too close to this computer. Just don't, just don't do a Tom Brady on it. Oh, maybe it's just that one that's not working. That one Did, yeah, working. don't do a Tom Brady. Don't start throwing things. <laughs> Okay, um, so we're mo senior center moving in today. Yep, they're they're moving in. Uh, they should be unpacking this afternoon. They should have moved in this morning and um, probably be unpacking for a couple days. But um, good. Start in earnest later this week or next week. Okay. All right, town administrator. Uh, yep, just. Two quick updates. Um, one is uh, the police department applied for and received a $13,000 grant uh, for road safety. Um, and then the other piece of news was that, uh, and, and a thank you to our legislators who I know um, advocated strongly for this in the final budget, chapter 70 was increased because they funded school choice Previously, they assumed school choice was going to be funded at $30 per student, and it was funded at $60 per student. So um, basically, Frontier lowered our assessment by um, about $3,500. So not life-changing money, but <laughs> every little bit helps. Um, and we're certainly appreciative that, that um, you know, they recognized uh, that and, and gave the, the funds back to the towns. Um, that was a good gesture. Well, I don't know if Dominic wrote the last article, but one of our school districts to the west had a significant money change it was from transportation. Was that you that wrote that? No, time? it was uh, Dom Charlemont, right? For home. Yeah, but in seeing that, um, our present administration, the pre and, and, and pretty much the last administration that we had also, they've been, the way we work things and the information that we get is there's a great greater sense of working together because of the information that we receive. And while $3,500 may not seem like a lot in a town, when we look at $3,500 for us in town is a lot of money. I mean, when we're doing budgets, right? I mean, Crystal, your, your first budget oh, yeah. was last year, and you'll know, and, and you'll, and Nathan will see it this year, when we talk $3,000, that's that's a lot of money for us, and 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 it doesn't it's like we have an eight million dollar budget, but we still we still s squeeze that three thousand dollars. So I would just like to thank Darius and and his team because it is important, and in 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 that communication, that communication is critical, and and 
that we get we get good information from them they get good information from us and we keep those lines open so did talk about schools though so that if you could just pass along our appreciation um and and again it's not the amount that's important but the fact that that there is an open line of communication like that um how's the uh playground coming along it's looking almost finished i haven't gotten an official we're done um but it's i i believe they poured the surface um and the structures are in so i'm just waiting for uh the the official word that it's done or what the last uh, little things they have to clean up are okay good anything else nope okay anybody uh crystal nathaniel anything nope nope all right so without hearing anything sorry yeah uh -huh. one more thing which is uh, in case there is no meeting next Monday, the deadline to pay taxes is October Monday, October 3rd. And I just wanted to put that out there for anybody who might be listening. And, well, actually that was well done also because lately you've been getting the bills in Christmas time. So... We're, we're getting that that's that's shaping up also um, on that note are we planning on meeting next monday or are we not at this time i don't have anything particular for the agenda um and we do have a hearing for um a liquor license application scheduled for the third um so right now i i we don't add okay. on the agenda. So there's no meeting next week? Yep. Unless an emergency comes up. Sounds good. All right? Yep. Okay. Anything else? No. I motion we adjourn. Seconded. <laughs> yeah, motion made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Jeff 3-0, declare us out at uh, 623.